the rock and mankind are having a really high profile feud as well. It's going to end the night after the pay-per-view in Memphis when the rock defeats mankind with Paul White's help in a ladder match. He wins the WWF title to set the stage for WrestleMania. And there was just an incredible series of matches between those two. I know that when people think about the rocks, most high profile feud, they almost always go right to Austin. And I understand that, but before that happened on a really big level, call it 15, 17, 19, the feud with mankind, at least to me, really put the rock on the map. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Cause Mick was established. He was a recognized global star. Uh, he was unusual, unique. And, uh, I thought he brought the best out in the rock and, and to the rocks credit of being a green guy. Uh, he didn't miss a beat. He didn't miss a beat because Dwayne's always been real smart. I talked about that before here. You know, he, he had a, he had a great way of forecasting. He had a great way of asking the right questions. So, uh, yeah, it was good, man. It was, uh, I was very happy with, uh, that match and that program. It helped rock immensely. So maybe Mick doesn't get the credit that he deserves, but, uh, in any event, uh, he was, a uh, it was a key cog in developing Dwayne Johnson. No doubt about it. He said over the years, by the way, he being Mick Foley, that he thought the original plan for WrestleMania 15 was supposed to be a three-way which would have been a now baby face Mick Foley and a baby face, of course, stone cold, Steve Austin and a heel rock. And ultimately Mick believes Shawn Michaels maybe got in the ear of, uh, of Vince McMahon and had it changed because he felt like WrestleMania, the poster, if you will, should be mono a mono. It should be one-on-one. A lot of guys believe that kind of, I happen to believe that too, as a matter of fact, not that I anti triple threat matches. Cause I'm the first guy that ever booked <clears throat> a significant amount of triple threat matches in, a, in the WWE territory back in the day. Uh, but I, I agree with that. I think that poster is means a lot. And I think that it's, uh, just makes common sense. You know, we should have enough expertise booking and matchmaking, uh, to come up with a one-on-one match that we could all enjoy and not be convoluted not have too many cooks in the kitchen, shall we say? And, uh, anyway, it was, it was all good, man. I, I, that was a good time for me as an announcer because the angles were so real and they're based in re- realness. So, uh, I was, I was really happy with the, how the booking was rolled along there. Whoever was contributing the most should get credit for it. Uh, but it was fun. It was fun to call. It was fun to watch too. It is interesting to think how the, the views have changed on WrestleMania over the years though. I mean, here we are in 99 saying, Hey, you know, we really can't have a multi-person main event. And then one year later, we have a four way with a McMahon in every corner. Right. And even the guy who allegedly says, Hey, it can't be a multi-man match. Shawn Michaels says that in 99 fast forward to 2004, he becomes the third man in the main (laughs) event. You know, yeah. three one at WrestleMania twenty. So, you know, things change. That's uh that's just the way it is in professional wrestling. And it's like casting a movie, it's like casting a sitcom or a TV show. You know, you want the right chemistry, you want the right pieces uh to to put into that dish. It's like making soup, Conrad. Uh, you know, to me the best soups are homemade and they are they have multiple ingredients, they're cooked slow, they're they're allowed to, to develop. And I thought we'd made some good soup with that deal. We've also got uh, Shane McMahon doing a little in-ring wrestling here. I mean, we've seen him have skirmishes and some fights here and there, and certainly some tag matches. He's actually going to win the European title here. I know that he did all sorts of crazy stunts and he was really, you know, thrown to the wolves here at times. Maybe, uh, you know, we're testing his metal. I'm not really sure. What, What was the, did you get any feedback from the talent? about Shane McMahon, quote unquote, taking up TV time away from the other traditional. No, not really Conrad. Not really. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is, is that everybody saw that Shane's heart was in the right place. He really, he really wanted to do this to contribute to the company's success and talents that had any common sense could see that was what was happening. So, uh, 
uh, no, I didn't have any issues with it. He, if he had been arrogant and conceited and, uh, you know, just a, a, a miserable prick to be around different reaction, but Shane was, was, uh, at least in my memory was very well liked. And he was just one of the, he wanted to be one of the boys. He worked hard to be one of the boys and the boys saw that and they embraced the concept. Dave Meltzer and the observer had this to say about Shane. Shane as a character is way too similar to that of Eric Bischoff. Vince is a super performer. Not that he doesn't get out of control at times. Shane is a good performer doing heel interviews, but he oversteps and does so much of what he's not good at as well. And due to that, he comes across as the boss using the TV as his ego tool, man. I, I understand we're playing conspiracy theorists there, but that sounds like that is uh, 180 degrees different than, than what your take was. Yeah. Well, it, it, it Meltzer had his opinion and I respect anybody's opinion, uh, whether I agree with them or not is irrelevant. Uh, but I didn't, I don't agree with that assessment. I do look the kid. Shane was very un, unexperienced, inexperienced. Uh, he was, uh, if Shane had a fault. It might be the fact that he didn't have as much in-ring product knowledge as he would like for many to believe. And God knows we have plenty of brilliant minds around there that can contribute and help him. And he's an athletic kid. He, he's, he's fearless. Uh, and, uh, he was having the time of his life. And I thought that was pretty cool. Let's talk about Paul white. We mentioned uh, St. Valentine's day massacre earlier, that big uh, headlining match with, with Vince McMahon and stone cold. That's where Paul white makes his debut. And it does feel like the first few months we're off to a bit of a rough start where we're just calling him Paul white. It doesn't feel like, um, I don't know. What was your impression? Your first impression of working with Paul white. We'll say the first several months in WWE. Did it feel like a fit for you? Uh, yeah, I felt pretty good. Uh, you know, I had a little bit of experience with Paul white. He played junior college basketball at Northern junior college in Tonka Oklahoma, uh, two year school. And, uh, then he was, the deal was set up. I believe if I recall, uh, correctly that he was going to go from there to his predetermined destination of Wichita state and play hoops. So, uh, so we had that in common. His coach at Northern junior college was a old friend of mine. So uh, I had a little insider in Burton, but in insider information on him. And, uh, I, I used it to help to establish a relationship because Paul White's not any different than anybody else in wrestling. He's going to have some issues where he's going to be, uh, uh, you know, in, insecure especially when you know that you're this massive body, uh, that, you know, he, he started from scratch. He was athletic enough and he had the aptitude, uh, and he listened to others, which was good. But I, I, I thought, I didn't think we got out of the box overtly strong with him, uh, to be honest with you. 